Hi, I'm Tim, I'm CEO, founder of Apple Software. Uh, I've uh, helped start a number of nonprofits and uh, worked at a church for a number of years. So I've gone through this startup process a bunch of times. Um, it's not as difficult as it seems. When you do your first one, it's challenging. Uh, when you do the second one, it's like, oh, I remember how to do all this stuff. And after you've done a few of them, you realize, uh, if I just know the steps and the checklist, then it's, uh, it's pretty easy to do. Filed articles in corporation with the Secretary of State to gain my um, to bring the entity into existence. I called the IRS and got an EIN. Um, now it exists there. I um, drafted and signed incorporator minutes, relinquishing control to the board that I've decided, if you will. The board then had board minutes where they adopted the rules by which they're going to operate, which are the bylaws. Um, then what we do is we draft the, um, we fill out the form 1023, which is the tax exempt application. So when you have your, um, your corporation formed with the secretary of state and you need to turn it into a nonprofit corporation, that basically what you do is you submit a 1023 with the IRS. Um, that is the tax exempt application with the IRS. There's some steps you have to do before you submit it. So basically, when you formed the corporation with the Secretary of State, it was you, the individual, that signed the document saying, this nonprofit ought to exist. Now, when I'm submitting a 1023 to the IRS, that's on behalf of the corporation or the entity. So you have to draw a link there between the two saying, yes, I'm a part of this thing and I deserve to be able to file and it's a thing. and so there's some steps that have to take place. Um, one of the first steps that you do when you, um, after you form the corporation with the Secretary of State, is you draft what's called incorporator minutes. And that's where you'll um, basically draft minutes, board minutes, which just think of a Word document. The Word document outlines, this is what we talked about. So there's nothing special about minutes. It's just notes of a meeting. And so you'll draft incorporator minutes. These incorporator minutes are you as the incorporator. You incorporated this thing. You draft minutes and you say, um, I'm signing over um, basically ownership of this corporation to these people. And that's basically where you can outline the beginnings of a board. And you'll say, Here's, here are the, are the people now in control. And so you basically hand over, I no longer can just sign on behalf of this thing as a person. Now I'm giving over control to the nonprofit itself and it has a board. So uh, you wanna make sure that you um, have the right people on your board. You wanna make sure um, that you don't um, sign that over to somebody that you are not gonna want in the long run because you're giving control of this thing over. They now basically own it. Um, as soon as you do that incorporator minutes and you sign that, now they have control. And then the thing you want to do immediately after that is have your first board meeting and your first board minutes. And so a lot of times this all happens at the same time. You basically draft your board minutes, you draft your incorporator minutes, you sit with your board and you all talk about it and you all sign all these documents. And so what it looks like on the board minutes is um, these are guys now have control of this thing and they assign who um, are the officers, they assign any other directors that they wanna, um, or appoint any other directors that they want on the board with them. And they basically in the first minutes also adopt the bylaws. So bylaws um, it are governing documents. Um, bylaws, think of a, a Word doc that's you know 10 pages long or longer or however long, and it basically outlines this is how this entity is going to run. These are the rules by which we're going to run this entity. So um, there's four people on the board. Three of them want to buy a building and one of them doesn't. Can you do it or not? So that that's what the board the the bylaws talk about. They say um, you know this is what the president officer's role is, this is the vice president, this is the treasurer's role, and this is what they do and their responsibilities. And then here's how we're gonna make decisions. These things require unanimous vote. 
these things require super majority vote. These things require simple majority vote. These things uh, don't require any vote. The executive director of the nonprofit can, can just make these decisions. So uh, the bylaws outline a lot of that kind of stuff, um, how meetings will be held and how often and how many people can be on the board, you know, and that kind of deal. So the bylaws are a lot of work to draft. Um, there are a lot of good examples uh, on the internet that you can pull down and, and use as kind of guideline. And then you want to make sure that you tweak it to make it kind of yours or how you want to operate. Um, it's probably not bad also with the bylaws to um, have an attorney or someone look over them. Um, you could have them draft them if you're looking to save money. You can kind of draft what you think and have them look it over and they'll tell you where you might be tripping up. But um, once the bylaws are drafted, so to kind of go back, I've got this um, corporation that's been formed with the Secretary of State. I used articles of incorporation. I filed those with the Secretary of State. Now this thing exists. So now I'm going to go find who do I want on the board. I'm going to draft my bylaws. I'm going to draft incorporator minutes and my first board minutes. We're all going to meet together and the incorporator minutes are where I basically sign over um, the entity and I say I'm no longer going to be the sole decision maker for this thing. These people are now in control. Um, then the board now has its first meeting now that I've given them control I've relinquished control and then they have these minutes minutes are just the notes of what happened in a meeting and um, in the first board minutes the newly appointed board basically adopts bylaws the bylaws they'll they'll basically put in the minutes we the board adopt the bylaws dated whatever so there's a sentence in there and then you attach the bylaws to the minutes and they all sign the minutes and you put them in a file cabinet never to be seen again. So um, that's the first board minutes. Um, the bylaws now are drafted. Now you know the rules of operating the entity. Um, all of that's required in filing your 1023. With the application, you attach all these documents to it. You mail it to the IRS. The documents you attach are things like an expedite request, um, policies and procedures that you've adopted, the bylaws and that kind of thing. You mail them all the IRS. The IRS then, um, if you're approved, gives you what's called a tax determination letter. That letter comes in the mail, it's one or two pages, and it basically says you are approved. This entity is approved to be a tax exempt um, entity under you know, 501c3. And so uh, with that letter, now that's your proof that you've gone through this application process with the IRS and the IRS is okay with you being not paying taxes, income taxes. Um, so you're not quite done yet. The next thing you need to do is get exemption from your state agency. So just because um, you know companies pay taxes or people, um, in most states to the state as well as the federal government. So now you're exempt from the IRS, doesn't mean you're exempt from the state. Um, most states um, just wanna know that you're exempt with the IRS and then they'll say, okay, you're good with us too. But you have to go through that process. And so um, in California, I believe it's the um, uh, FTB 3500 is the form, kinda like the IRS form is the 1023. So you're going to want to Google your um, state agency and figure out what the application is with the state and then read the instructions for that. And for many of them, it's you fill out the first page, your name and address, and everything, and then include your, ta your tax determination letter that you got from the IRS. So you want to go through the federal process first, all the way, get the approval, attach it, now send it off to the state, now you're good with the state. So that's the typical um, path there. So it's possible that you would not be approved the first time you submit your Form 1023 to get your tax exempt status. That's not terribly uncommon. Um, I've um, a couple of the nonprofits that I've helped get started actually have had them kicked back, and most of the time they're just looking for more information um, or you filled something out incorrectly. A lot of nonprofits sell things, like a thrift store sells things. So if they fill it out and say, "Hey, we're gonna have a retail store." It's like, well, why should that be tax-free? So a lot of times um, 
they're just looking for more information or they're pushing on a, should this really be tax exempt? What goes on there? Um, with that, there's actually a ruling that takes place. Um, the IRS will give you um, what's called uh, an advanced ruling. And the advance ruling is a basically a five-year grace period to prove that you're tax exempt. And so what that is, is they basically, um, each year when you turn in your 990, your informational tax return, there's a schedule that you have to fill out, which um, is how you outline, this is where all of our money came from. And you basically say, the public is supporting this charity. The IRS basically gives you five years worth of data to accumulate to prove that, hey, it's not just a tax shelter. All the money is coming from this one individual that's trying to, you know, pass their money through you or something. And so five years of that, um, you're allowed to go and be an entity, try and figure it out, try and get your grassroots movement going, raise money. And then at the end of five years, each year you're turning in this document. This is, I think it's the Schedule A um, in the 990. And so at the end of the five years, they'll give a defi um, definitive ruling, I think is what it's called. And that's where they basically say, okay, it's no more, um, no more basically double checking, you're good to go.